and welcome to the Spectrum Show. Coming up, we get all the news and top selling games from June 1989. I take a look at the keyword system. I play some games, have a chat to Jeff, and end with some educational software. But first, here's the news. Like so many other companies, Ocean have decided to launch a budget label of their own. All titles will sell for $2.99, putting them in direct competition with Mastertronic and Codemasters. Ocean though have an impressive back catalogue to plunder, and early titles will include such classics as Rambo, Daily Thompson's Decathlon and Enduro Racer. The label, called Hit Squad, has an impressive lineup just waiting to be released, with games like Green Beret, Whizball, Batman, Arkanoid and Head Over Heels, all waiting for their turn. This looks like one budget label that will be worth buying titles from. The well-known 16-bit software house Psygnosis have finally stepped into the Spectrum world with its first release. Although one of their games, Barbarian, was released earlier, it was handled by Mastertronic, and not the company themselves. So this will be their first effort of their own. The game will be called Captain Fizz Meets the Blastertrons. Oxfam have announced a scheme to help game players tidy up their rooms. For a limited period, you can take your old computer games into any Oxfam store and donate it to charity. The games will be sold at a special event to raise money. So if you don't like your shelves looking all nice and colourful, lined with your favourite games, then this is an ideal chance to do some good and have a clear out. Micropros are set to launch not one, but two new labels for their games, MicroStyle and MicroStatus. Both of these labels are aimed, so the company says, at the more mature gamer. This doesn't mean though the titles will be of an adult nature. And that was the news, and now on to the top selling games. At number 5 is Operation Wolf from Ocean Software. At number 4, Dragon Ninja, also from Ocean. At number 3, Renegade 3 from Imagine. At number 2, Emling Hughes International Soccer from Audiogenic. And at number 1, Robocop from Ocean Software. And that was the news and top selling games from June 1989. Modern computers have a variety of different keyboards, but they all work in exactly the same way. You type what you want, letter by letter. Yes, you can create keyboard macros, but for the average user, it's still one letter at a time. The more you practice, the more proficient you become, with professional typists able to produce 100 words per minute without even looking at the keyboard. Even when you delve into programming languages, the story is the same. Functions, commands and labels are all entered letter by letter. Most home computers opted for this approach too. The Commodore VIC-20, C64, Atari 400, 800 and beyond. Apple II, the Mac, even early machines like the Oric, Jupiter Ace and Dragon 32 were all single key inputs, although the VIC-20 did have graphic characters as optional keystrokes. The only other computers that didn't opt for this input method was an early model of the TRS-80 and the Thomson M05 and M05e. Sinclair introduced keywords onto the public with the Sinclair ZX80. This trend continued through the ZX81 and Spectrum. This mix of shifted and extended mode options was meant to make programming easier and faster for the non-technical. The Spectrum though has up to four uses per key, which at first can be confusing, but they are helpfully colour coded, a great idea from the designers. The words in white are the main keywords, and these will be displayed when you first press a key at the start of a line or after a colon. The symbols and words in red at the top of the keys can be accessed by holding the symbol shift down and then pressing the key. The words in green above the keys are accessed by going into extended mode. To do this you hold the cap shift and press symbol shift and the cursor will turn into a flashing E and then pressing the key will give you that green word. The words in red below the keys are accessed by going into extended mode again but this time holding down the shift while pressing the key. All very confusing at first. 
The rubber key spectrum, for me, looks really cool because of this splash of colour all across the keyboard. But when you start using it, things often didn't go as planned and you could easily type the full word faster than it took you to actually work out how to get the keyword using all the different keystrokes, especially for rarely used ones like ABS or sign. The more you used it though, the more you remembered where the words were and how to get to them. Using emulation on a PC keyboard makes it almost impossible to write basic code. You can use some of the keyboard helpers found in some emulators, but it's still a pain. If you want to write basic in emulation, I would suggest something like Basin. This program lets you type code in the normal way and converts it into a file ready to load into an emulator. As you became more proficient, it seemed Sir Clive was right. It was faster and more convenient to write basic code using this weird input system. Games listings were a breeze. The rubber keys were also easy to use due to the spacing, but then Sinclair decided to change things. The Spectrum Plus was released in 1984, and the keyboard became much harder to use, at least it was for me. Not only had the colour coding gone, now everything was in white, but also the keys were closer together, and sometimes you could have pressed two at once by accident, and the whole process became clunky. The keyboard itself was better in many aspects, but accessing those keywords became problematic. When the 1 to 8 arrived, not much had changed, but Sinclair had introduced 1 to 8K Basic. Here you could enter code letter by letter, just like all the other micros on the market. And coming from a 48K model, I found this slow and error prone. The plus 2 improved the keyboard greatly, but Amstrad removed the keywords, leaving only load, code and run, so programming in 48K mode was practically impossible for newcomers. What were they thinking? Maybe trying to remove the familiar Sinclair branding, or trying to make the machine look more professional, who knows? The Plus 3 continued this, slowly erasing the keyword system from history. Today I can still remember many of the keyword placements, especially the commonly used ones like then or inkies, but still find myself struggling with the less used ones, and have to use the emulator's pop-up help. For me it was a good invention, a good way to entice people in, and a good way to make sure that what you typed was correct. It also meant, possibly, less reliance on syntax checking in the ROM, and maybe even less space, as each keyword had its own token. I'm not that technical, so I'm guessing at this, but logically, that would seem to be the most efficient way of storing things. I like the keywords. They looked great on the keyboard, giving the Spectrum a unique look. They worked well once you knew how to get them, and they did speed up programming once you got used to them. Today they would not be welcomed at all, though. Modern languages and environments are not suited to this kind of input. So for those of us who enjoyed this little bit of computing history, it's a nice trip down memory lane to enjoy when you encountered them for the first time, and again in later in life using emulation. In 1984, a new type of arcade game appeared in the seaside resorts up and down the country. It wasn't a shoot 'em up it wasn't a sports game, and it wasn't a platform game. It was a boxing game. Super Punch-Out had you controlling a wireframe boxer, throwing punches and dodging your opponent's attacks to try and win the title. Home computer and console versions soon began to show up, and in 1985, Elite Systems, in their usual underhand way, released an unlicensed version. Their game, though, featured a famous UK boxer called Frank Bruno, who rose to fame throughout the 80s, eventually winning the heavyweight championship in 1985, before losing it relatively quickly. Frank Bruno's boxing featured eight opponents to beat, all with silly names and characters. The inlay showed images of them all, along with their biographies, all trying to be funny and failing. The first opponent is the Canadian Crusher, and was obviously the arcade's bear hooker. The controls had you ducking left and ducking right, delivering body shots and headshots, and moving left and right to dodge your opponent. With so many controls, the game could get quite frantic, especially if you landed a few good blows and went for a killer punch. Frank and the opponents both had knockout meters, and each landing a punch lit up a segment. Once the meter was full, the next good punch would knock down either Frank or the opponent.
When down, they usually get back up quite quick though, and you have to keep plugging away, hoping to get lucky. If you beat the first opponent, the second one is Fling Long Chop. Yes, I know. And it all starts again. Each opponent has their own signature move, and strangely, Fling Long Chop has a sweeping kick, which is obviously illegal in boxing. Again, you have to identify when this attack is coming and either duck it or move out of the way. The graphics are very good. Frank is drawn in solid shades with the opponents in a sort of half wireframe view, but with plenty of detail. The movement is not so smooth, with punches that just happen rather than the fluid movement of the arcade. Sound is used well with a few spot effects for punches, counts and wins. It's not an easy game to progress, but it's fun to have a go. I found it a bit monotonous to be honest, having to go through the same actions over and over again, and when the opponents hit you out of the blue, it gets frustrating. An interesting end to the game advertises a data disc with new opponents and Scooby-Doo, both of which never materialised. The data disc never arrived at all, and Scooby-Doo was shelved and rewritten as a poor platform game. If you fancy a change from shooting or platforming, I suppose you could give this one a go, but don't expect too much. The year is 2086, and life is peaceful and passive on Earth. That is, until an evil alien attack force decides to spoil things. With all humankind taken prisoner and sent to work in the mines, only one can save the entire race. He was instructed to seek out the sacred armour of Antiriad, so that he may stand against the aliens and save the world, and so starts the game. You play Tal, and the instructions say you have to find other objects too, anti-grab boots, something called a particle negator, a pulsar beam and an implosion mine. This, as you can see, is an impressive looking arcade adventure, with graphics that made an impact on players when it was released back in 1986. Exploration and map making is the key here, as you guide Tal around the various screens that make up the Earth. There are, obviously, different things out to hinder you, and these include monkeys, large insects, drops of liquid and other weird things that you wouldn't really think of as being on Earth. But then again, it is 2086 after all. Your loincloth wearing hero runs around really well, and the animation is excellent. The throwing animation is particularly nice, and grabbing the stones on the first screen will help you clear a few nasties later on. Continue to explore the map and you will eventually find the armour, and turning round will allow you to climb into it, and this will refill all of your health bars, however you can't just go walking about. To do that you have to find the anti-grav boots, so you come out of the armour and go in search again. You can also collect energy blocks that are scattered about, because your energy decreases if you collide with any of the nasties. Once you get the anti-grab boots, if you can get that far, you can fly around, making movement a bit easier. Whilst wearing the armour, any other items found will be activated automatically, so there's no need to return to that part of the game. But you can't throw rocks when you're wearing the armour, so some sections require you to climb out first. I had to use the RZX playback to see the later levels of this game because it was a bit too tricky for me. That was more down to me wanting to find things out instead of being patient than the game actually being overly difficult. As mentioned before, the graphics are excellent with nice detail and varied backgrounds, good enemy sprites and great animation. Sound is okay, although a bit minimalistic, with only a few effects for hitting things with rocks and losing energy. Gameplay wise it's easy to control once you get used to the throwing mechanism which involves holding down the fire key while hitting a direction key, but overall a really nice game and one certainly to have a go at.
This is Quadron, released in 2018 by Andrew Beale. This is an interesting game in that development of this started in 1986, with the expected release a year later. In fact, the game was meant to be published in 1988 by Palace Software, but was cancelled before release. Now released though, the idea of the game consists of you controlling a robot that has to defend crystals in a complex of marauding aliens. To do this you have to patrol 28 rooms and destroy anything that moves, while at the same time picking up items as you go. The graphics are lavish, and in places are very reminiscent of Saberwolf. They're well drawn and look great. The sprites are large and well drawn and move very well too. The action is what you'd expect from a game of this kind. You move around the rooms and destroy anything that pops up. Sound is well used throughout with some nice effects, and the explosion effect done by use of attribute blocks is really nice. The game though is much more in depth than a standard shooter. Different alien types defined by colour do different things. Some collect small crystals and take them to be transformed into more powerful aliens, and these more powerful aliens are then really hard to destroy, taking a lot of shots to get rid of. Pressing space will display a sort of status screen, and you can see here what weapons you have, the map of the playing area in the top middle, and various other meters and information. You can also use this to drop certain objects, and also to teleport to one of the four corners if you have the right items to do so. If you take too long, yellow aliens appear and try to persuade you to get a move on. So there's just more for you to shoot. You can get power-ups and bonuses like normal shooters, but also you have to worry about transforming enemies. It's a bit like Defender in that respect. This is a well-written game, and if you like a mix of shooting with a bit of strategy, then this may be worth getting hold of. However, it isn't free. The game can be purchased by going to the URL on screen. So today we're going to do Patreon questions. We are our Patreon subjects that have been suggested. Uh, the first one is the game I was most disappointed with when I bought it. That's easy think, for me. Is it? I think I've got a few. Do you want to start? Mine was V. V, the Ocean game based yep. on that sci-fi thing. Yep. I saw it in the computer shop and he had the Amiga version. I said, is that Spectrum Graphics? And he said, yes. And I went, right, I'll have that. I rushed home with it, loaded it up and said, realised it wasn't the Spectrum Graphics to start with. And it looked kind of... It, i tell you what it looked like. It looked like a very, very early Metroid. It looked right. like it would be a side-scrolling kind of platformer shooter where you had to like get extra things and, and reading the back of the box and the blurb it sounded like that. And it wasn't basic, it was a maze puzzle game if anything. Right. I, I can't actually, I remember it being advertised heavily, mm. but I can't actually ever remember seeing it. So I might have to have a look at that and see if it is that bad. <laughs> Yeah, it 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 had a nice running. It, it it's like Prince of Persia, without all okay. the good bits. <laughs> okay, so that's that's not much of a game then, is it? Nah, it's not really. What were yours? Okay, I had two. The first one was Starion. Really? By by um, was it Melbourne House? Yeah. And I bought it because it looked like a really good 3D space flight simulator. And when I got it, it was awful. I played it for about five minutes and then turned it off and never played it again. I, I just maybe I was expecting a 3D shoot 'em up or something, and it, and it was a bit deeper than that, wasn't it? It was. Well, you had to solve anagrams, and I'm rubbish at anagrams. Yeah, I was taken in by the adverts as usual, and I thought this looks excellent. Let's have a go at this, and it was yeah terrible. I I, I, I have played it for five minutes, so I can't even remember anything about it other than I was so disappointed. Out of disgust, I just put it on the shelf and left it. So okay. <laughs> there's not a lot to discuss other than it's. I thought it was awful. Um, <laughs> and your other one? My other one, I think, is universally known as being a crap game, and it was the Great Space Race. You bought which was, you bought that? That was really expensive as well. I know. Um, and off the back of Valhalla, which was a really good game, a really good adventure game, well animated characters, and and I thought this has got to be good because they hyped that one up really, really well. Well, when it arrived, it, it was a basic game. It was awful. It was, well, it's not, I wouldn't say one of the worst games on the Spectrum, but it's 
by far the most disappointing, I think. Even even more disappointing than Starion when I got it, considering it was a big box and it had all that stuff inside it. Yeah, and that was before a big box with a load of extra giveaways inside it. You should have started alarm bells. That was There weren't any before <laughs> that that should have started alarm bells, were there? I know. I mean, they must have spent a lot of money on that. I think this. Mm. I think they actually said in in one of the adverts or one of the news things they've sent spent something like two hundred and fifty thousand pounds, and that was a lot back then mm. on this game. And it just didn't show apart from the packaging. They must have spent it all on packaging. Didn't they just basically spend all of the profits from Valhalla on the Great Space Race? <laughs> very, <laughs> very I, probably. I think that because because that was it. They went out of business after that. So what's the next question? The next we- question is a sort of flip of that, which is the game I was most impressed with when I bought it. That's that's an interesting one. That's hard. I have two, and they're old school. The first one was Manic Miner. Uh, everybody's going to say that. Mm. When it came out, there was nothing like it, really, on the spectrum. And it did so many things that other games didn't do. You know, continuous music, smooth sprites and all that, and, and a bit of humour and weird and wacky stuff. So I thought that was that was really impressive. And the other one, which everybody will also say, is Night Law, for obvious reasons, yep. which which was a showstopper. Um, however, I can't play 3D games at all. So I'm, um, so I'm, it, I'm thinking about it, and back in the day, I think the game I was most impressed with was probably Bard's Tale. It's almost certainly Bard's Tale. Bard's Tale, that kind of 3D, into-the-screen RPG, Western RPG style, I, I just played it for hours and hours and hours and hours. Mm. Well, a, a lot of the a lot of the games that would impress people was probably um, Ultimate Games because they, they sort of set the kept setting the bar higher and higher each each time they brought a new one out until they got to Underworld and that that sort of didn't work really well. Yeah, there's a, there's another topic I might suggest where um, we can talk about Underworld actually. <laughs> This is 3D Side Avatar, released in 1984 by Houston Consultants. In this rather impressive 3D game, you control a drone, patrolling the streets on the lookout for side abs. If you spot them, the only course of action is to destroy them. You have a short range scanner to help navigate the streets, and the top part of the screen displays the view from your drone. You continually move forward, and the controls involve turning left and right, and moving your sights up and down. The graphics are very nice, with a good feeling of flying down a street at night. They're smooth and work really well, and the map is easy to follow with your drone being the flashing dot, and the enemies being the solid dots. Sound is good with a continuous clicking for your engines and various effects for firing and explosions, which look quite good too. If you manage to clear the first map, which I never did, it says the game plundered you into the countryside, with more shooting. Control is easy, and the game is impressive, especially for a 16k title. If this is your thing, then give this one a go, if for nothing else but to see the 3D effect. Live launched the ZX Spectrum with the focus not on games, as it is better known for, but for the business and education market. The well-known battle between Acorn and Sinclair over the BBC contract is well documented and was covered in the excellent Micromen film. On the business side, there were a few programs that covered the basics. Word processing, spreadsheets and databases offered limited use, but the lack of fast storage meant uptake with businesses was stifled. On the education side, there were more titles released though, 
and the only barrier to making it a success was the ever-growing games that were flooding the market from launch. The educational side rarely gets covered, with only a few mentions in magazines at the time, and hardly ever in modern media. So, were they any good, and could they be used as a learning aid? There were several companies putting out educational titles, Sinclair amongst them. Others included Griffin and Europress. Griffin released several titles covering spelling, mathematics and reading, so let's dive into one and have a look. This is Wordspell from Griffin Software, released in 1983. The program, as it suggests, helped children with words and spelling. The program has various word lists you can use, and you can even add your own. You can view a summary of the available tests, effectively separate parts of the program, and these include short vowels, prefixes, suffixes and soft letters. The short vowel section gives you three minutes to complete it, and you are shown a word to remember. You are then asked to spell it again. If you get it wrong, the program shows you the correct spelling and lets you have another guess. The words were all three letters, which was obviously very easy for an adult, but you have to remember this is aimed at children. The input was slow, which meant, as a fairly fast typer, I had to slow down to avoid getting it wrong. The display was bright and easy to read, with large, friendly letters. The other tests were all similar, adding extra things like double letters and silent letters into the mix. There was a lack of animation though, or really good graphics, and here the only thing you got was ZX81-like Space Invaders, so I'm not sure how long this would hold the attention of a child. Another program from Griffin was called Get Set, which was a sort of simple puzzle counting game. Here you have to add or remove a certain number of things from the existing number of things shown on screen. Here, for example, you have three stars. You are then asked if you want to add or remove some. And you are then asked what the final sum is once you've done that. All very basic. The graphics are very simplistic, using block graphics. And the method of input is odd, and involves pressing the plus, minus or new keys at each stage. And it would have been far better to offer three options like 1, 2 or 3, or A, B or C, rather than getting the people to press two keys at the same time. You can extend the number of objects to work with up to 20, which make things a little harder, so this package can be used as the child progresses. Again, like the previous title, there's no animation, which is a bit of a shame. The items do appear in a sort of patterned hash flashing thing, but that's all. On the other side of the tape is something called partition. This changes the questions, and you have to guess the number to add to another number to get the total. And this is made slightly easier because you can count the objects on screen at the other side of the partition, which is a squiggly line. So far these two titles that I've looked at would do the job. However, I don't think it would hold the attention of a child for very long, because there's no animation and nothing to keep them interested. I'll be taking a look at some other titles in future episodes.